what we instituted in the practice was number one, uh, what we call a rule of 20. So for every 20 minutes, I instruct the person, whether it's a student or an adult, to look up and look away at a distance object for 20 seconds, count to 20, and blink during that 20 seconds. And we're talking about deliberate blinks. Blinks where you close your eyes and open them, where you bring your upper lid down to your lower lid. Um, that, has, uh, that has two effects. Number one, it helps to break the constant stare and the fixation, the muscle memory, if you will, at the plane of the computer screen. The second thing it does is it also enables the outflow and the production of the tear film, which is ever more important these days when it comes to clarity of vision and the external surface of the tears. Hey there, I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Grace Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves and enjoy a little chocolate in the process. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. Okay, now, before you see this title of this episode or see that it's about eye health and think, ah, I have great vision, this doesn't apply to me, please, please, please stay with this conversation. Today's guest, Dr. Kevin G helps me understand what is happening to our eyes and with our vision as a result of all of our screen time. And I think probably most of us can agree that we are all getting a lot of screen time. He introduces me to the concept of COVID syndrome and gives us really applicable ways to help our eye health as we find ourselves on screens more and more, especially during this period of online schooling and uh, maybe working from home. Dr. G is an optometrist who completed his undergraduate degree and earned his doctor of optometry, both from the University of Houston. He's received multiple op- optometric designations and awards and has a private practice in Missouri City, Texas, where he's also a supporter of many local groups and schools. You will hear he has a true passion for education as he taught me about what we can learn about our overall health just by looking into the eye, how COVID is affecting our eye health and vision and realistic ways to manage the hours we are required to be on screens. Before I get to Dr. G, I do have a special free program to offer you. This is for anyone who wants strong legs, but maybe their knees won't let them do squats or lunges. You can go get this free guide for 12 movements to strengthen seven muscles, a video showing you how to do them, and three customizable workouts plus a little bonus warm up. You can get it at gracedhealth.com slash strong legs. And I'm calling it squat free strong legs because yes, you can strengthen your legs even if you can't squat and lunge. Okay, let's bring on Dr. G. Dr. G, I am so glad that you are here today. Welcome to the Grace Health Podcast. Thanks for having me. Um well okay so this is really exciting to me. And I just want to give our listeners a little bit of a background. And by the way, I have full permission from my son to do this. So you are a local optometrist. And um, my son has had um, vision issues in the past. He had strabismus when he was younger, and then it kind of corrected itself. And we were told, look, this is probably going to go the other way, and you're probably going to have vision problems later. So he, when he started complaining, he was like, mom, I can't see my vision's not very good. My vision's not very, very good. I was like, well, you know what? Let's just go up to Dr. G. I've heard great things about him and let's get your vision, vision, vision checked. My, I totally anticipated for you to be like, yep, it's gone the other way. He needs glasses. And you taught us all about the eye so much that I was like, do you like educating people? (laughs) Would you like to come on? (laughs) So I really want to talk a little bit more. But before we get into that, I would love it if you could tell us just a little bit about yourself and uh, your path to being an optometrist and uh, what you drew, what drew you to that. Well, great. And again, thanks for having me. Uh, it was very, very brief, believe it or not. I, I grew up in a traditional home. 
and uh, back in the 80s uh, with mom and dad at home. Dad was an, was a pharmacist. Mom was a stay-at-home mom. And I, I kind of felt like I wanted to be in the health professions. And I didn't at the time like blood very much. <laughs> um, so I was looking for something that was non blood related per se. And, uh, I was kind of cornering myself towards maybe dentistry. Um, I didn't want to follow in my father's footsteps because he had some pretty crazy hours. Um, he was working for independent pharmacists and I'd see dad come home at late, late hours and whatnot. And just didn't want to, just didn't want to follow in those footsteps and, and be there for my family in that way. And so uh, optometry kind of found, found, found me. And then I started getting enthralled with uh, the inner workings of the eye and the things that you can see and the things you can detect in, in an eye exam and through examining the eye. And so um, as a junior, actually, in high school, I dedicated uh, to pursuing optometry. My, my choice of my undergraduate uh, degree actually dictated um where I went to school because at the time there was only one uh, optometry school in the state of Texas and that was the University of Houston. So I thought I'd get myself grounded in that and um, that's kind of the rest is history. So um, finished off in 1998 with a biology degree from the University of Houston and in 2002 um, from the University of Houston College of Optometry. Wow. Well, you are one of the unusual and lucky ones who found what you loved early because that's, uh, that is definitely not the case for a lot of people. That's, that's pretty, that's great. Okay. So you touched on one of the first things that I want to talk about, which is, can you tell us a little bit about the inner workings of the eye and what we can learn about our health when we, when you, not me, <laughs> but uh, when we can look into the eye. So I guess that's one of the things that really has evolved over the years. Again, going back to the 80s when I was um, learning, or I should say maybe more like the 90s when I was learning more about the eye, um, I learned these things about the eye, but literally we really kind of evolve into the medical knowledge that we are now, that we have now. To know that uh, the eye being an essential organ of the body um, is connected to the mate, to the vascular system of the uh, of the, uh, the central vascular system, if you will, of the body. So one of the things that um, we oftentimes look at when we look into the eye is we look at the optic nerve, which is the plug from the eye to the brain. Um, that that nerve is a living, breathing piece of tissue, and it connects to your spinal cord. So unfortunately, one of the things that we oftentimes can find is when there's swelling in the optic nerve, we can oftentimes find signs or hints towards things like multiple sclerosis or autoimmune conditions that are also inflammatory um, if, those op if that optic nerve is compromised. Um, in some cases, uh, if that optic nerve is severely compromised or lacking blood flow, um, we t oftentimes see uh, cardiovascular events that are impeding or currently ongoing. Uh, and I can't say that those are rare. Uh, those are actually quite common. Uh, a lot of folks will come to us with headaches. You tell your story, um, which has a corollary uh, to folks that will come to us with headaches. And, and uh, we'll look into their eyes and we'll see things that I just described. Um, or uh, maybe on a mild, so on a mild case, um, or mild case, things like high blood pressure or diabetes that also too can be detected in the back of the eye through the vasculature that's connected to the heart. So it, it, it really has expanded um, our, uh, our detection and our knowledge over the years. That's interesting. I'm curious, you know, I don't know a lot about um, the process of identifying autoimmune, but I know sometimes it can kind of be more of a process of elimination rather than a diagnostic test. And I'm wondering if this is one step that people can take if they have, or if they suspect an autoimmune issue is like make an eye, make an appointment with an optometrist and get someone looking inside of your eye. Is that what, is that something that might be helpful? That definitely is helpful. And, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves in is just our interdisciplinary correlations or relationship with um, the uh, other specialties and the things that correlate. So there, there are a multitude of tests that can be performed in an optometrist's office um, that, you know, like you say, unbeknownst to the general public, are, don't 
they're not very aware of. Um, specifically, one of the tests that's um, very diagnostic is what's called an ocular coherence tomography, or we call it OCT, where it scans the different layers of the retina and specifically the elevation of the optic nerve. And it puts itself up against the normative database where we can compare um, age uh, related norms to see if there's anything abnormal to that. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. So it's not necessarily, you're not just the place to go if we're having problems with vision. Like <laughs> there's a lot of other, a lot of other tests that you can do to look inside our overall health. And yes. And so, and that's, that's part of the part that we, that I really enjoy is the, the fact of being able to tell somebody, listen, you know, do you, have you investigated the possibility of diabetes? Have you investigated the possibility of um, rheumatoid arthritis? Do, do you have joint pain aches anywhere else in the body? And then be able to facilitate and help get that visit into a rheumatologist or an endocrinologist or something of that sort to investigate further. And I love that. And I, and I really appreciate too, that integrative approach, because I think for so long medicine was very siloed. And I think now we're starting to see a little bit more of working together and, and collaboration for lack of a better word, um, which I think is so helpful because we're not, you know, our health is not just our liver or just our kidneys or just our eyes, right? It's all, it's all connected. That is great. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, screens. And when I say screens, I mean our computers, our phones, um, televisions, not so much, at least for the younger generation. <laughs> and uh, talk to me a little bit about what is happening to our eyes when we are staring at screens for so long. So this is something that's been really on our radar for a number of years. Uh, so if we can re reverse back to pre, uh, pre um, iPad textbook computer days, which wasn't that long ago, um, when I think in the context of our high school here, that was right around what, 2013, when the high school came up, I was served on the campus-based leadership team there. And when they were about to roll out digital textbooks, um, I was on there and, and, I, and, I, and I made a comment about this because at the time we knew that we had some studies in place that were being involved, that were involving and uh, talking about the um, blue light that comes off of our LCD displays. Um, and that's a big deal. Um, you know, we hear it a lot in the office, in our office about the Amazon blue light glasses and whatnot, but I want to kind of kind of go on a record to say those may be legitimate. I don't know, but I will tell you that there is fact to the effect of blue light and the effect of blue light really is that what happens is it alters your melatonin levels and it disrupts your sleep patterns. Uh, anecdotally, we will tell you that in our office, we have a number of patients that have, that we've seen um, probably since middle school graduated through high school and college and now entering the workforce. And they come in and they tell us, well, I have a hard time sleeping. Um, we ask them what they're doing. And they say, well, I sit eight hours at a time in front of a computer screen. Um, and their next resort oftentimes is to go to a melatonin supplement or something of that sort. We mm -hmm. typically prescribe them the blue light filtering glasses. And anecdotally, like I say, we get feedback to say um, it's worked. Um, there's some other additional things uh, about the screen that we can talk about. And, you know, COVID's kind of fast forwarded us into that. But um, did you have any other questions about that? Yeah, well, I, I would let, let, yeah. So talk to me a little bit. Okay, so define blue light and tell me exactly what it is doing and how it is impacting us. So blue light that we're talking, that we're referring to is the low wavelength blue light that's not even visible to the visual system. So if you think about the RGB um, uh, spectrum of light that we all learned in science class back in grade school, um, this is a blue light that falls very close to the wavelength of UV, but it's low wavelength um, in the sense that you can't see it. And... Um, it's, it's emitted from every LCD backlit display that you could imagine. So whether it's the computer screen or your phone um, or an iPad or any type of digital device like that, you're going it, to, it's, it's, it's the, it's, there's a glow of it off of the screen. Okay. And, 
Oh, I'm sorry. Can I interrupt and ask a question pertaining to that? Uh, I have an iPhone and I know that it kind of will go a little bit darker when, after the sun sets, whenever it somehow it knows when the sun sets, does that, is that impacted at all? Or is it still there? Am I fooling myself to think that the blue light is decreasing when the, the background goes a little bit darker? So you, you have to check your settings. Uh, first of all, that that may be the dynamic lighting that you may have set in your kind of brightness, but they're actually in reference to in the the iPhone. There's also an Android uh, setting for it too. There's a way to turn the blue lights off at a certain time of the day. Um, in the iPhone, it's called night shift. Um, and you can turn it off towards the end of the day. And that's where it got its term and definition from when... Apple discovered it is the recommendation from those early studies was that you weren't supposed to be on your phone um, for a couple of hours prior to going to bed because of that disruption in your sleep pattern. And that's where that term came from, but they never really changed it. And we've come to find that it's actually the cumulative um, exposure over the day's time that alters that melatonin level. Oh, really? Okay. So it's not, I'm not guaranteeing or promoting good sleep if I'm turning it off an hour and a half ahead of time, but I'm still on it 11 hours prior to that. That's what we've come to learn over a period of time. Initially, the initial studies were don't do it right before you go to bed, but we've come to find that it's cumulative through the day. Okay. Well, what's someone to do? I mean, we've got kids on online schooling. Uh, We're working on the computers. We get off the computers. We want to zone out and scroll our Twitter feeds or Instagram feeds. Um, I would, what are some realistic ways that we can manage that? So you describe what I call the COVID syndrome, frankly. Um, (laughs) And so you, you think about it and it sounds crazy, but we go down the list. I mean, we've got virtual schooling, we've got work from home parents and adults, we have quarantined other folks that are told to not go anywhere. So you've got more free time than ever to mess around and, and Mm -hmm. uh, scroll through, like you say, your Instagram feeds, Facebook and Twitter. Um, And so one of the things that we have instituted into our practice is uh, really kind of what we termed a back to school um, practice. And mainly because I was very, very, if you will, awestruck by the uh, amount of uh, time that a, that a the student was going to be spending on a computer screen, not just an in instruction, but also to the assignments that were going to have to be done, uh, much less, like I say, the textbooks and things and the handouts and things that have to be read. And so, um, What we instituted in the practice was, number one, uh, what we call a rule of 20. So for every 20 minutes, I instruct the person, whether it's a student or an adult, to look up and look away at a distance object for 20 seconds, count to 20, and blink during that 20 seconds. And we're talking about deliberate blinks, blinks where you close your eyes and open them, where you bring your upper lid down to your lower lid. Um, that has uh, that has two effects. Number one, it helps to break the constant stare and the fixation, the muscle memory, if you will, at the plane of the computer screen. The second thing it does is it also enables the outflow and the production of the tear film, which is ever more important these days when it comes to clarity of vision and the external surface of the tears. That's step number one. Can you go into that tear form a little bit for us? Because when you were educating my son and I, I thought that was fascinating. And I can tell you what he has told me after using what you recommended, but go ahead and explain that. I don't want to jump ahead of time. That's okay. So uh, I'll take, I'll go right there. I didn't want to jump ahead either, but so a lot of folks just don't realize this, both patient and doctors alike don't understand that there are we learned it in school, but they just they, we just don't talk about it enough. Uh, your tears are made out of three essential components. They're made out of fat, water, and oil. Very few people are missing the fatty component. I like to call that the ice skating rink layer. It's the layer that's smooth and easy, where that Zambozi comes across and smooths it out so that you can ice skate along it smoothly. Um, very few people are missing that. 
The parts that are oftentimes deficient are is that watery component, that crocodile tear, that tear that you get when you yawn, the emotional type tear, that watery component that's that's produced by what's called the lacrimal gland. And in my opinion, the most important part is the last part that I mentioned, the oil component. The oil component is a, a protective layer that helps prevent the evaporation of tears. Water and oil don't mix. So without that oil component on the very exterior component, uh, surface of the tears, your tears are going to rapidly evaporate. So at the base of your upper and lower lids, there are glands that are called the meibomian glands. And these meibomian glands are excreted with the force of a blink, not a forceful blink, but just a natural blink. And one of the things that we have also come to note way back in the late 70s, early 80s, before I even entered into the profession, we have studies that show that folks that did concentrated work have a decreased blink rate. So now you can kind of see where this is coming full circle while staring at a computer screen and staring at a device, whatever it may be, staring at cross-stitching back in the day. We don't blink very often. And when you don't blink, you don't, you don't bring those two lids together to express the meibomian glands. And when you don't express the meibomian glands, those oils don't go inside your tears. And when those oils don't go inside your tears, your tears rapidly evaporate. And that's why it's a perfect sandwich, so I like to say, that needs to be in balance for all of our patients. And so that's why that blink plays a role, taking a break plays a role. Um, and then we've also instituted one additional step um, that we like to recommend in the form of what we call a warm compress. Um, and we have a mask that's commercially available that helps melt and emulsify those oils throughout uh, at night before you go to bed to help pick up the pieces for when you have forgotten to blink throughout the day. Okay. As you're talking, I am thinking about, or thinking that this is one more benefit of meditating. <laughs> I don't know if you meditate or not. I have been trying to get in the habit of doing it a little bit more, but sitting there for three, five, 10 minutes with my eyes closed, I never, it never occurred to me that this is also benefiting my eye health and my vision <laughs> and my, and my tear production. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I've been lit up quite a bit by uh, one of the meditation apps, I should say. Uh, it'll stay uh, unknown uh, just uh, for that for, for purposes of the podcast. But I, I certainly do take my, my breaks and try to, per se, practice what I preach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. I hadn't, that, I, I hadn't ever put any of that together. Okay. So the first thing that you said to do when we are on screens, because, you know, th there's a difference between summertime when kids are home or a weekend when, you know, we'd have less going on and we're just mindless scrolling, looking on. And then the weekdays when we either have work or school or something else that is requiring us to be on, on the computer. So the first thing you said, because I just want to make sure that I got this down, um, is that rule of 20 every 20 minutes, take a 20 second break. And then the second one is the uh, warm compress. That's the recipe for success for us if we can get to it soon enough. Now, unfortunately, these days we're running into some train wrecks in the office where it's a little bit too late. Um, so we have to go a little bit more interventional um, with some other additional uh, treatments. Okay. So this is not something that can be taken care of on your own at any time. I mean, it sounds like it's a rheumatoid arthritis that it will progressively get worse and, and then you're going to have to have help. Like it's not, I mean, I'm, I don't know if that that's a good example or not, but it's something that you, you can't just put it off and think, well, I'll just take care of it later. Like, otherwise it's going to get worse. Exactly. It's a progressive condition. The condition specifically is called meibomian gland dysfunction, or as we like to abbreviate it, MGD. Now this isn't anything new. I mean, we've been talking about this for years and uh, it's just only because of the current situation. And I think not just the current situation, but just because of our digital integration into society, it, it's just taken off. But COVID definitely has played a significant role in pushing us over the edge on it. it yes, it really did. It really did. Okay. So how do we know if we think, I mean, is there a good test to do at home? And I don't know if test is the right word of like, this is something that um, I can take care of on my own, or my vision really might be impacted and I need to make an appointment and go in. 
So I think there's three key components to, if you will, self-monitoring, um, making sure that you don't necessarily need to go in. Um, and it starts with number one, does your vision ever fluctuate? One of the things that we get a lot from patients is they think that their visions, well, you, you made a point mm-hmm. of it a while ago. You get mm-hmm. folks that come in and they talk about my vision's disrupted and they'll tell me that it it changes and it sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Um, and that I think that would be number one. If you notice that your vision's fluctuating, sometimes clear on certain days than others, sometimes clear during certain parts of the days than others, uh, other parts of the day, then that might be an indication that 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 those meibomian glands aren't secreting or functioning as well or to their optimal ability. The second thing is just overall blur, um, specifically at night, Um, because you think about it, working throughout the entire day and those stagnant oils that happen uh, to clog up those glands throughout the entire day, we were, uh, just as an aside, the, the office prior to COVID, we were open for four days a week and seeing patients late into the evening. This was our routine. We were seeing patients late into the evening for, till eight, nine o'clock at night. So I would get folks that would come in and they say, listen, I couldn't, I can't, I got a hard time driving here. And I asked them, well, what have you been doing all day long? And so they were fixated on a computer screen all day long. Well, I thought I'd get a couple extra hours of work in since I had this late appointment. Um, and what happens is, remember, these are just these are muscles that help us focus. So those muscles get stuck in one plane of focus. And that's what causes um, the inability to relax them and allow you to see clearly far away. So if you notice that your vision's blurrier at night than it is during the day, and I think a lot of folks have just said, all right, that's just the way it is. Um, because I've always had difficulty seeing at night. Um, That may not necessarily always be the case. The third component really is, it sounds funny in a kind of comedic way, is that a lot of folks will tell us that that their eyes are teary. And that goes back to what I was saying, is that the, the secretion of the lipid layer the oil layer from the meibomian glands acts as a sealant, as a protectant to keep the the tears on the eye. So I can't tell you, I mean, many many of your listeners are probably here saying that, oh, I've been to an eye doctor before and my eyes were watering um, and they told me my eyes were dry. The term dry eye, in my opinion, just needs to go away. Um, We really know a lot more about the tear film these days that we can specialize in which layer we need to focus on. And that's usually the case is the, the meibomian glands aren't working as well. So a watery eye that, um, that you've been told before is a result of dry eye is, is typically um, one of the signs of uh, overstrain on the computer screen as well. Does that tend to happen more at a particular time of day or can that happen anytime? Asking uh, for a friend. <laughs> we hear, <laughs> um, so we hear it all day long. It happens okay. anytime. It can be any time of the day. Okay. I just, I find my eyes are real teary in the morning, which I thought was, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, so maybe that's something that I need to consider and start implementing <laughs> some of these things that you're talking about. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit, but I want to um, make sure that I've covered it all and that there's not something that we have missing, but are there any home remedies or recommendations that you have to kind of help um, produce the, you know, produce the tears, help the eye for those three components to be working well together all in the way that they're supposed to be? So that's a very good question. So number one, uh, a great intake of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I like to say, get it naturally, get it mm-hmm. through, get it through your fishes. Um, get And, you know, if, if you're not able to do that, I specifically like a product, and I'll go out on the record to say this. I'm not um, endorsing them. I don't have any loyalties as a disclaimer to them. Um, but Nordic Naturals makes an, a great omega-3 fatty acid. That, That's the um, one I use. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it doesn't give you the fish burp. It is fish oil. It doesn't give you the fish burp. And it, it has a nice, um, even, if you will, um, uh, 
I'm, I'm, you just can't even tell that you're taking it. Yeah, it, it, it and it works really, really well. The second thing is is that uh, it, is if you can find a way to get you a commercially commercial grade um, hot compress, and specifically the one that's been used most routinely in the studies has been a mask called the Bruder mask, and they even have Bruder has an Amazon store um, that something you can throw in the microwave and um, use that nightly. We like to tell that tell folks to use to do that at night before they go to bed and just fall asleep in it. Um, it can be reused and you don't have to be boiled. It just, uh, as some, some of these activating masks have to be like boiled in water. These, just, this, you just throw in the microwave for 20 seconds. Can uh, you spell that for me? It's Bruder, B R U D E R. Got, and I will find the link and put that on Amazon. That's good to know. Okay. So that's number two. Sorry to interrupt, but otherwise that's I forget okay. to go back and ask these things. Got it, <laughs> What's got number it. three? And then just blinking. Hey, I, I think I'm going to rename myself or change one of my one of my handles, whether it's Instagram or, tw- or Twitter, to the Blink Doctor. Because doctor. patients, <laughs> patients are coming in, going, "You're going to tell me to blink again, aren't you?" Um, and that's exactly. And we have a blink analyzer in the office where we analyze folks' blinks and the completeness of their blinks. And um, I'm one day I'm, I'm really going to count conscious of mine right now. <laughs> and you should be. That's the idea. <laughs> That's the idea. We want you thinking about it. We that and because it is a subconscious thing that we just don't do. And you know, again, we have deprogrammed ourselves from doing it. Wow. Okay. Yes. So definitely with the blinking. Anything else that we have not covered here that as a um as an optometrist, you really wish every like, I just wish everybody would do this or knew this. Wow. So that's the elephant in the room. And I'm going to be real gentle with this one. Um, I, I wish that folks knew that the recommendation from the American Academy of Optometry and American Optometric Association is that your first, your child's first eye exam should be at two years of age. Whoa, really? And yes. And so think about it. How many times, and this goes really to the audience as a rhetorical question, because I can't get their feedback from it, um, is think about if or when you took your child for their first eye exam. And then think about how many times they went to the dentist prior to that first eye exam. Teeth can be replaced. Eyes can't. When it comes to strabismus, when it comes to amblyopia, those types of things need to be caught at a criti- during the critical phase of development that we can um, uh, detect and treat accordingly, not surgically, but through therapy and through corrective lenses if, if needed. Um, and then uh, if needed at the very end, if it doesn't work, then obviously surgery, but that's, regard- that's reserved for later in life. But we usually define the critical period between um, birth and seven years of age. And if you're waiting till kindergarten to bring your child in, we've only got about two years to work on things. And unfortunately, by that time, sometimes you, the child has a hard time seeing and has already been labeled. And that's the part that really kind of tugs at my heart is that these children, they're smart and they're bright kids. They just can't mm-hmm. see. And um, it's just something that you know, pediatricians don't do a great job at recommending it. We come across as billboard artists and commercialists and capitalists by saying it ahead of time. So that's why I said that's the big elephant in the room for me is I, I, every time I say it, I get the same response that I got from you. Um, but that is the recommendation across the board is that first vision test should be at two years of age formally. But there's also a, uh, a program called Infant C, S-E-E, that um, a number of us um, participate in. And we do free screenings for babies for any crossed eyes and things of that sort that may go undetected in a pediatrician's office. Is there a link or a website that people can go to if they have a baby and they're looking for one of those free screenings? Like that, does it have a list of doctors who participate in that? So the American Optometric Association sponsors that. We're not compensated by any means, but it's an initiative by the American Optometric Association. So the AOA.org and you'll see a big banner on there for infancy. Got it. Okay. And that makes a lot of sense with what you're talking about with, you know, just catching it early. I mean, there's so much going on with 
young elementary age kids and, um, you know, just taking that off the table or knowing that that's something that needs to be addressed, I think is probably a really big component. And I have to say, I mean, my kids are in their teens now, but when they were little, I just kind of figured going to the pediatrician and doing the, you know, read the, or I don't even, obviously it wasn't letters. I guess it was pictures. I'm not really even sure. I don't remember. It's God, it's been a while, (laughs) but you just assume that that's, that you've got it covered there. So what you're saying is no, let's do this a little bit more in depth and get a better baseline. Yes. And I think I'll just to expand upon that a little bit, I think one of the things that maybe parents might have a misconception about is the ability to, that we rely on the subjective responses of a child. And we absolutely do not. In a situation like that, everything's objectively measured. So, I mean, all I need from the child is to sit in the mom or dad's lap and look at something. And we have fixations, videos that they watch um, while they're looking at a, at a distance um, to get them to fixate. And we can do almost every one of our tests objectively without their patient's response. We, uh, you know, just co- the, the cooperation mainly revolves around kind of a playtime. It turns into a little bit of a light playtime with the, with the doctor in the doctor's office. Okay. Well, that is really cool to know. And it's also, I'm sure, I mean, I have to admit the first thing that thought that went to my mind was like, are you going to try and get like their forehead up on that thing and the chin down on the thing? And like, so what you're saying is no, they probably won't even know what you're doing, but you will be able to do what you do. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. This, um, this is so informative. This is great. Can you tell people, and then I have two more questions, but can you tell people um, where to get in touch with you um, and, and get a hold of you if they have more questions? So you can get me, um, definitely our website uh, is uh, fully functional. And if you are on a mobile device, actually, and go to our website, there's a little button to the side that you can text me um, any time of the day, any day of the week. It's actually labeled 24 seven text. And that comes straight to my phone, Um, our website. uh, I'll let you reference accordingly, Um, but also to our social media, um, both Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're on all of those. Um, And then one of the things that's a that I like to kind of spout off on every once in a while is is our blog. And I mentioned that to you. I'm sure you read a little bit into it Um, is the blog where I just kind of let my thoughts and feelings kind of flow. Um, so, uh, if you want a little more edgy side of me, that's where you kind of go read a little bit more about me. Got it. Awesome. Um, yes. And I'll put the links in all of that below so everyone, um, can go check those out. Okay. Two last questions. One is something I've been asking, uh, all of my guests recently. I am fascinated by tattoos. I don't have any, but I think a lot of people, uh, those who choose to get them often have really interesting stories to go along with it. So I was wondering if you have any, if you would be willing to share a story with it. And if not, if you had to get one, what would it be and where would it go? So that is really an interesting question. Um, number one, I, and I don't mind disclosing this. I'm 44 years old. So we're kind of falling out of that generation before tattoos were like the cool thing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm 46. So, the same. <laughs> so, mom was like, no, you're not getting one. Um, but I, I, one of the things when I became an adult, obviously I had the freedom to do so. I actually toyed with the idea of getting one and um, just God bless it. I'm glad I didn't um, because I actually was going to have grace in Latin tattooed on my ring finger. And given what I do right now, I don't wear my wedding band in the exam lane. I guess I'd probably have to wear something over it to probably cover it. I don't know. It might, might be more widely accepted now, but I think in my early career, probably not, but I almost had it. I had a tattoo put on my, on my hand, um, which would have been a whole nother conversation. (laughs) But I think it's kind of ironic that we're, it, it yeah. would have been the word grace. And here we are talking about your, your, your podcast. So that's right. That's right. It probably would be more accepted now. I think I read a statistic that like 70% of people have tattoos. And, you know, what I have learned is even those who don't, cause like I don't, and every now and then at the dinner table, you know, my kids will talk about, I'm like, well, if you had to get one, where would you get? And I'm like, I don't care if you get one, you just better like, you know, that it's never going away. So, um, 
but every now and then they're like, mom, you want one, don't you? And I'm like, I really don't. I just think it's, I think it's really interesting. But anyway, back to what I was saying is most of my guests are like, well, I've kind of thought about it or I don't, but if I did, so I just think it's, I think it's a little bit more uh, generally accepted now. <laughs> yeah. It um, seems their own, but I, I don't, I honestly don't have any desire whatsoever to get one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but like I said, I've had some really cool stories with, um, with people when I've just kind of pointed out and I'm like, Oh, tell me about that. That's kind of neat. So, um, it's just a fun way to connect with people. The second question I have is, is there a meaningful scripture that you would like to uh, share with my community? And thank you for that opportunity. Uh, so one of the things that we did um, and as I was a college student is uh, we were building an addition to our church. And as a college student, I wasn't making any money. And uh, one of the things you may find in my bio is that I, that I played a saxophone. And at the time, I had a friend that had a professional recording studio, and he, he allowed me to use his recording studio. And I recorded a CD and then sold it. Um, back then you're just barred in CDs. Um, so I was barred in CDs and I sold it. So I had to make my own CD cover and all, everything that I sold, um, went to the, uh, to the building fund. And the, again, I was a college student thinking about going and going into, going into, into optometry. And so the cover of it was a, was an eye with the cross in the, in the pupil. And the, the Bible verse that was on the front of the CD was second Corinthians four eighteen, And it says, uh, so we fix our eyes on not what is seen, but what is unseen since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And I've come to find that that's a sense of refuge for me. Um, every day is that, especially in these unknown times, every day is unknown, but especially in these unknown times that we've recently kind of, kind of go through that, um, God's got all this planned out for us and he knows how the story is going to end. Mm-hmm. Amen. I love that. That's so great. Dr. G, you, this has been great. I can't wait for everybody to hear it and implement some of these things, uh, whether or not they are on working, you know, from home, online or school. I mean, I think probably we are all on our screens more than, um, than we need to be. So I, I think I'm going to make a sticky note on my computer and say 20, you know, the 2020 rule <laughs> and remind myself to look outside my window and for 20 seconds. So I think that is going to be my plan of action. But this was great. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thanks for the opportunity. Hopefully it's helpful. The answer is yes, it was helpful. (laughs) I learned so much from Dr. G and I really hope you did too. I have such a new appreciation for eye exams and their holistic importance, not just how it relates to my vision. Since we've recorded this, I've also been more aware of looking off into the distance and uh, just intentionally blinking more often. All of Dr. G's contact information is in the show notes, as well as the compresses or the compress he mentioned. If you're local, I highly recommend Dr. G if you need an eye care provider. And if you're not, you can subscribe to his blog and stay updated. Now, don't forget to get your squat free strong legs at gracedhealth.com slash strong legs. Yes, links to everything are in the notes. Also, this feel oh, it's just always really weird asking this. But if you find value in this show, would you bless me with a $5 virtual cup of coffee? There are a lot of back end costs associated with producing this podcast and the content on my website and socials. It's all free to you but not to me. Any one time or monthly support you can give is greatly appreciated. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Amy Connell. I'll put the link in the show notes. And if that's not in your budget, or if that's not something you want to do, that's fine. I understand simply sharing any episode to even just one friend if not all of your Facebook friends, that's super helpful, or you can leave a review. What's the one simple thing I want to remember, which is something I try to do with all of our uh, guests and episodes, and that is the rule of 20 Dr. G suggested. I think that is a very applicable way to find intentional moments to uh, get our eyes off the screen, to close our eyes, to get that oil circulating, and just to take 
simple care of our eye health. Okay, that is all for today. Go out there and have a great day.